This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Reflections on the Guillotine by Albert Camus Part 1 Shortly before the War of 1914, an assassin whose crime was particularly repulsive, he had slaughtered a family of farmers, including the children, was condemned to death in Algiers. He was a farm worker who had killed in a sort of bloodthirsty frenzy, but had aggravated his case by robbing his victims. The affair created a great stir. It was generally thought that decapitation was too mild a punishment for such a monster. This was the opinion, I have been told, of my father, who was especially aroused by the murder of the children. One of the few things I know about him, in any case, is that he wanted to witness the execution for the first time in his life. He got up in the dark to go to the place of execution at the other end of town amid a great crowd of people. What he saw that morning, he never told anyone. My mother relates merely that he came rushing home, his face distorted, refused to talk, lay down for a moment on the bed, and suddenly began to vomit. He had just discovered the reality hidden under the noble phrases with which it was masked. Instead of thinking of the slaughtered children, he could think of nothing but that quivering body that had just been dropped onto a board to have its head cut off. Presumably, that ritual act is horrible indeed if it manages to overcome the indignation of a simple, straightforward man, and if a punishment he considered richly deserved had no other effect in the end than to nauseate him. When the extreme penalty simply causes vomiting on the part of the respectable citizen it is supposed to protect, how can anyone maintain that it is likely, as it ought to be, to bring more peace and order into the community? Rather, it is obviously no less repulsive than the crime, and this new murder, far from making amends for the harm done to the social body, adds a new blot to the first one. Indeed, no one dares speak directly of the ceremony. Officials and journalists who have to talk about it, as if they were aware of both its provocative and its shameful aspects, have made up a sort of ritual language, reduced to stereotyped phrases. Hence we read at breakfast time in a corner of the newspaper that the condemned has paid his debt to society, or that he has atoned, or that at 5 a.m. justice was done. The officials call the condemned man the interested party, or the patient, or refer to him by a number. People write of capital punishment as if they were whispering. In our well-policed society, we recognize that an illness is serious from the fact that we don't dare speak of it directly. For a long time, in middle-class families, people said no more than that the elder daughter had a suspicious cough, or that the father had a growth, because tuberculosis and cancer were looked upon as somewhat shameful maladies. This is probably even truer of capital punishment, since everyone strives to refer to it only through euphemisms. It is to the body politic what cancer is to the individual body. With this difference, no one has ever spoken of the necessity of cancer. There is no hesitation, on the other hand, about presenting capital punishment as a regrettable necessity, a necessity that justifies killing because it is necessary, and let's not talk about it because it is regrettable. But it is my intention to talk about it crudely, not because I like scandal, nor, I believe, because of an unhealthy streak in my nature. As a writer, I have always loathed avoiding the issue. As a man, I believe that the repulsive aspects of our condition, if they are inevitable, must merely be faced in silence. But when silence or tricks of language 
contribute to maintaining an abuse that must be reformed or a suffering that can be relieved, then there is no other solution but to speak out and show the obscenity hidden under the verbal cloak. France shares with England and Spain the honor of being one of the last countries this side of the Iron Curtain to keep capital punishment in its arsenal of repression. The survival of such a primitive right has been made possible among us only by the thoughtlessness or ignorance of the public, which reacts only with the ceremonial phrases that have been drilled into it. When the imagination sleeps, words are emptied of their meaning. A deaf population absent-mindedly registers the condemnation of a man. But if people are shown the machine, made to touch the wood and steel, and to hear the sound of a head falling, then public imagination, suddenly awakened, will repudiate both the vocabulary and the penalty. When the Nazis in Poland indulged in public executions of hostages, to keep those hostages from shouting words of revolt and liberty, they muzzled them with a plaster-coated gag. It would be shocking to compare the fate of those innocent victims with that of condemned criminals. But aside from the fact that criminals are not the only ones to be guillotined in our country, the method is the same. We smother under padded words a penalty whose legitimacy we could assert only after we had examined the penalty in reality. Instead of saying that the death penalty is first of all necessary, and then adding that it is better not to talk about it, it is essential to say what it really is, and then say whether, being what it is, it is to be considered as necessary. So far as I am concerned, I consider it not only useless, but definitely harmful, and I must record my opinion here before getting to the subject itself. It would not be fair to imply that I reached this conclusion as a result of the weeks of investigation and research I have just devoted to this question. But it would be just as unfair to attribute my conviction to mere mawkishness. I am far from indulging in the flabby pity characteristic of humanitarians, in which values and responsibilities fuse, crimes are balanced against one another, and innocence finally loses its rights. Unlike many of my well-known contemporaries, I do not think that man is by nature a social animal. To tell the truth, I think just the reverse. But I believe, and this is quite different, that he cannot live henceforth outside of society, whose laws are necessary to his physical survival. Hence the responsibilities must be established by society itself, according to a reasonable and workable scale. But the law's final justification is in the good it does or fails to do to the society of a given place and time. For years, I have been unable to see anything in capital punishment but a penalty the imagination could not endure, and a lazy disorder that my reason condemned. Yet I was ready to think that my imagination was influencing my judgment. But, to tell the truth, I found during my recent research nothing that did not strengthen my conviction, nothing that modified my arguments. On the contrary, to the arguments I already had, others were added. Today, I share absolutely Kostler's conviction. The death penalty besmirches our society, and its upholders cannot reasonably defend it. Without repeating his decisive defense, without piling up facts and figures that would only duplicate others, and Jean Bloch Michel's make them useless, I shall merely state reasons to be added to Kostler's. Like his, they argue for an immediate abolition of the death penalty. We all know that the great argument of those who defend capital punishment is the exemplary value of the punishment. Heads are cut off not only to punish but to intimidate, 
by a frightening example, any who might be tempted to imitate the guilty. Society is not taking revenge. It merely wants to forestall. It waves the head in the air so that potential murderers will see their fate and recoil from it. This argument would be impressive if we were not obliged to note, one, that society itself does not believe in the exemplary value it talks about. Two, that there is no proof that the death penalty ever made a single murderer recoil when he had made up his mind, whereas clearly it had no effect but one of fascination on thousands of criminals. Three, that, in other regards, it constitutes a repulsive example the consequences of which cannot be foreseen. To begin with, society does not believe in what it says. If it really believed what it says, it would exhibit the heads. Society would give executions the benefit of the publicity it generally uses for national bond issues or new brands of drinks. But we know that executions in our country instead of taking place publicly, are now perpetrated in prison courtyards before a limited number of specialists. We are less likely to know why and since when. This is a relatively recent measure. The last public execution, which took place in 1939, beheaded Weidman, the author of several murders, who was notorious for his crimes. That morning, a large crowd gathered at Versailles, including a large number of photographers. Between the moment when Weidman was shown to the crowd and the moment when he was decapitated, photographs could be taken. A few hours later, the Parisois published a page of illustrations of that appetizing event. Thus, the good people of Paris could see that the light precision instrument used by the executioner was as different from the historical scaffold as a jaguar is from one of our old Pierce arrows. The administration and the government, contrary to all hope, took such excellent publicity very badly and protested that the press had tried to satisfy the sadistic instincts of its readers. Consequently, it was decided that executions would no longer take place publicly, an arrangement that, soon after, facilitated the work of the occupation authorities. Logic in that affair was not on the side of the lawmaker. On the contrary, a special decoration should have been awarded to the editor of Parisois, thereby encouraging him to do better the next time. If the penalty is intended to be exemplary, then not only should the photographs be multiplied, but the machine should even be set on a platform in Place de la Concorde at 2 p.m. The entire population should be invited, and the ceremony should be put on television for those who couldn't attend. Either this must be done, or else there must be no more talk of exemplary value. How can a furtive assassination committed at night in a prison courtyard be exemplary? At most, it serves the purpose of periodically informing the citizens that they will die if they happen to kill a future that can be promised even to those who do not kill. For the penalty to be truly exemplary, it must be frightening. Tot de la Bouvier a representative of the people in 1791 and a partisan of public executions was more logical when he declared to the National Assembly, it takes a terrifying spectacle to hold the people in check. Today there is no spectacle, but only a penalty known to all by hearsay and, from time to time, the news of an execution dressed up in soothing phrases. How could a future criminal keep in mind, at the moment of his crime, 
a sanction that everyone strives to make more and more abstract. And if it is really desired that he constantly keep that sanction in mind so that it will first balance and later reverse a frenzied decision, should there not be an effort to engrave that sanction and its dreadful reality in the sensitivity of all by every visual and verbal means? Instead of vaguely evoking a debt that someone this very morning paid society, would it not be a more effective example to remind each taxpayer in detail of what he may expect? Instead of saying, if you kill, you will atone for it on the scaffold, wouldn't it be better to tell him, for purposes of example, if you kill, you'll be imprisoned for months or years, torn between an impossible despair and a constantly renewed terror, until one morning we shall slip into your cell after removing your shoes, the better to take you by surprise while you are sound asleep after the night's anguish. We shall fall on you, tie your hands behind your back, cut with scissors your shirt collar and your hair if need be. Perfectionists that we are, we shall bind your arms with a strap so that you are forced to stoop and your neck will be more accessible. Then we shall carry you, an assistant on each side supporting you by the arm, with your feet dragging behind through the corridors. Then, under a night sky, one of the executioners will finally seize you by the seat of your pants and throw you horizontally on a board, while another will steady your head in the lunette, and a third will let fall from at height of seven feet a hundred and twenty pound blade that will slice off your head like a razor. For the example to be even better, for the terror to impress each of us sufficiently to outweigh at the right moment an irresistible desire for murder, it would be essential to go still further. Instead of boasting with the pretentious thoughtlessness characteristic of us, of having invented this rapid and humane method of killing condemned men, we should publish thousands of copies of the eyewitness accounts and medical reports describing the state of the body after the execution, to be read in schools and universities. Particularly suitable for this purpose, the recent report to the Academy of Medicine made by doctors Pierre de Levier and Fournier. These courageous doctors, invited in the interest of science to examine the bodies of the guillotined after the execution, considered it their duty to sum up their dreadful observations. If we may be permitted to give our opinion, such sights are frightfully painful. The blood rose from the blood vessels at the speed of the severed carotids. Then it coagulates. The muscles contract, and their fibrillation is stupefying. The intestines ripple, and the heart moves irregularly, incompletely, fascinatingly. The mouth puckers at certain moments in a terrible pout. It is true that, in that severed head, the eyes are motionless with dilated pupils. Fortunately, they look at nothing, and, if they are devoid of the cloudiness and opalescence of the course, they have no motion. Their transparence belongs to life, but their fixity belongs to death. All this can last minutes, even hours, in sound specimens. Death is not immediate. Thus, every vital element survives decapitation. The doctor is left with this impression of a horrible experience, of a murderous vivisection, followed by a premature burial. I doubt that there are many readers who can read that terrifying report without blanching. Consequently, its exemplary power and its capacity to intimidate can be counted on. There is no reason not to add to it eyewitness accounts that confirm the doctor's observations. Charlotte Corday's severed head blushed, it is said, 
under the executioner's slap. This will not shock anyone who listens to more recent observers. An executioner's assistant, hence hardly suspect of indulging in romanticizing and sentimentality, describes in these terms what he was forced to see. It was a madman undergoing a real attack of delirium tremens that we dropped under the blade. The head dies at once but the body literally jumps about in the basket, straining on the cords. Twenty minutes later, at the cemetery, it is still quivering. The present chaplain of the Sante prison, Father Devoyod, who does not seem opposed to capital punishment, gives in his book Les Delinquants, an account that goes rather far and renews the story of Languille, whose decapitated head answered the call of his name. The morning of the execution, the condemned man was in a very bad mood and refused the consolations of religion. Knowing his heart of hearts and the affection he had for his wife, who was very devout, we said to him, Come now, out of love for your wife, Commune with yourself a moment before dying. And the condemned man accepted. He communed at length before the crucifix. Then he seemed to pay no further attention to our presence. When he was executed, we were a short distance from him. His head fell into the trough in front of the guillotine, and the body was immediately put into the basket. But by some mistake, the basket was closed before the head was put in. The assistant who was carrying the head had to wait a moment until the basket was opened again. Now, during that brief space of time, we could see the condemned man's eyes fixed on me with a look of supplication, as if to ask forgiveness. Instinctively, we made the sign of the cross to bless the dead, and then the lids blinked, the expression of the eyes softened, and finally the look that had remained full of expression became vague. The reader may or may not, according to his faith, accept the explanation provided by the priest. At least those eyes that had remained full of expression need no interpretation. I could adduce other first-hand accounts that would be just as hallucinating, but I, for one, could not go on. After all, I do not claim that capital punishment is exemplary, and the penalty seems to me just what it is, a crude surgery practiced under conditions that leave nothing edifying about it. Society, on the other hand, and the state, which is not so impressionable, can very well put up with such details and, since they extol an example, ought to try to get everyone put up with them so that no one will be ignorant of them and the population, terrorized once and for all, will become Franciscan one and all. Whom do they hope to intimidate otherwise by that example forever hidden, by the threat of a punishment described as easy and swift, and easier to bear, after all, than cancer, by a penalty submerged in the flowers of rhetoric. Certainly not those who are considered respectable, some of them are, because they are sleeping at that hour, and the great example has not been announced to them, and they will be eating their toast and marmalade at the time of the premature burial, and they will be informed of the work of justice, if perchance they read the newspapers, by an insipid news item that will melt like sugar in their memory. And yet, those peaceful creatures are the ones who provide the largest percentage of homicides. Many such respectable people are potential criminals. According to a magistrate, the vast majority of murderers he had known did not know when shaving in the morning that they were going to kill later in the day. 
as an example and for the sake of security, it would be wiser, instead of hiding the execution, to hold up the severed head in front of all who are shaving in the morning. Nothing of the sort happens. The state disguises executions and keeps silent about these statements and eyewitness accounts. Hence, it doesn't believe in the exemplary value of the penalty, except by tradition and because it has never bothered to think about the matter. The criminal is killed because this has been done for centuries, and besides, he is killed in a way that was set at the end of the 18th century. Out of habit, people will turn to arguments that were used centuries ago, even though these arguments must be contradicted by measures that the evolution of public sensitivity has made inevitable. A law is applied without being thought out, and the condemned die in the name of a theory in which the executioners do not believe. If they believed in it, this would be obvious to all. But publicity not only arouses sadistic instincts with incalculable repercussions eventually leading to another murder, it also runs the risk of provoking revolt and disgust in the public opinion. It would become harder to execute men one after another, as is done in our country today, if those executions were translated into vivid images in the popular imagination. The man who enjoys his coffee while reading that justice has been done would spit it out at the least detail. And the texts I have quoted might seem to vindicate certain professors of criminal law who, in their obvious inability to justify that anachronistic penalty, console themselves by declaring, with the sociologist Tard, that it is better to cause death without causing suffering than it is to cause suffering without causing death. This is why we must approve the position of Gambetta, who, as an adversary of the death penalty, voted against a bill involving suppression of publicity for executions, declaring, If you suppress the horror of the spectacle, if you execute inside prisons, you will smother the public outburst of revolt that has taken place of late and you will strengthen the death penalty. Indeed, one must kill publicly, or confess that one does not feel authorized to kill. If society justifies the death penalty by the necessity of the example, it must justify itself by making the publicity necessary. It must show the executioner's hands each time, and force everyone to look at them, the over-delicate citizens, and all those who had any responsibility in bringing the execution into being. Otherwise, society admits that it kills without knowing what it is saying or doing, or else it admits that such revolting ceremonies can only excite crime or completely upset opinion. Who could better state this? Then a magistrate at the end of his career, Judge Falco, whose brave confession deserves serious reflection. The only time in my life when I decided against a commutation of penalty and in favor of execution, I thought that, despite my position, I could attend the execution and remain utterly impassive. Moreover, the criminal was not very interesting. He had tormented his daughter, and finally thrown her into a well. But, after his execution, for weeks and even months, my nights were haunted by that recollection. Like everyone else, I served in the war, and saw an innocent generation die. But I can state that nothing gave me the sort of bad conscience I felt in the face of the kind of administrative murder that is called capital punishment. But after all, why should society believe in that example when it does not stop crime, when its effects, if they exist, are invisible? To begin with, capital punishment could not intimidate the man who doesn't know that he is going to kill, who makes up his mind to do it in a flash, 
and commits his crime in a state of frenzy or obsession. Nor the man who, going to an appointment to have it out with someone, takes along a weapon to frighten the faithless one, or the opponent, and uses it although he didn't want to, or didn't think he wanted to. In other words, it could not intimidate the man who is hurled into crime as if into a calamity. This is tantamount to saying that it is powerless in the majority of cases. It is only fair to point out that in our country, capital punishment is rarely applied in such cases. But the word rarely itself makes one shudder. Does it frighten at least that race of criminals on whom it claims to operate and who live off crime? Nothing is less certain. We can read in Coastler that at a time when pickpockets were executed in England, other pickpockets exercised their talents in the crowd surrounding the scaffold where their colleague was being hanged. Statistics drawn up at the beginning of the century in England show that out of 250 who were hanged, 170 had previously attended one or more executions. And in 1886, out of 167 condemned men who had gone through the Bristol prison, 164 had witnessed at least one execution. Such statistics are no longer possible to gather in France because of the secrecy surrounding executions. But they give cause to think that, around my father, the day of that execution, there must have been a rather large number of future criminals who did not vomit. The power of intimidation reaches only the quiet individuals who are not drawn toward crime and has no effect on the hardened ones who need to be softened. In Kostler's essay, and in the detailed studies, will be found the most convincing facts and figures on this aspect of the subject. It cannot be denied, however, that men fear death. The privation of life is indeed the supreme penalty, and ought to excite in them a decisive fear. The fear of death, arising from the most obscure depths of the individual, ravages him. The instinct to live, when it is threatened, panics and struggles in agony. Therefore, the legislator was right in thinking that his law was based upon one of the most mysterious and most powerful incentives of human nature. When law ventures, in the hope of dominating, into the dark regions of consciousness, it has little chance of being able to simplify the complexity it wants to codify. If fear of death is indeed a fact, another fact is that such fear, however great it may be, has never sufficed to quell human passions. Bacon is right in saying that there is no passion so weak that it cannot confront and overpower fear of death. Revenge, love, honor, pain, another fear managed to overcome it. How could cupidity, hatred, jealousy fail to do what love of a person or a country, what a passion for freedom managed to do. For centuries, the death penalty, often accompanied by barbarous refinements, has been trying to hold crime in check, yet crime persists. Why? Because the instincts that are warring in man are not, as the law claims, constant forces in a state of equilibrium, they are variable forces, constantly waxing and waning, and their repeated lapses from equilibrium nourish the life of the mind as electrical oscillations, when close enough, set up a current. Just imagine the series of oscillations, from desire to lack of appetite, from decision to renunciation, through which each of us passes in a single day. Multiply these variations infinitely, and you will have an idea of psychological proliferation. Such lapses from equilibrium are generally too fleeting to allow a single force to dominate the whole being. But it may happen that one of the soul's forces breaks loose 
until it fills the whole field of consciousness. At such a moment, no instinct, not even that of life, can oppose the tyranny of that irresistible force. For capital punishment to be really intimidating, human nature would have to be different. It would have to be as stable and serene as the law itself. But then, human nature would be dead. It is not dead. This is why, however surprising this may seem to anyone who has never observed or directly experienced human complexity, the murderer, most of the time, feels innocent when he kills. Every criminal acquits himself before he is judged. He considers himself, if not within his right, at least excused by circumstances. He does not think or foresee. When he thinks, it is to foresee that he will be forgiven altogether or in part. How could he fear what he considers highly improbable? He will fear death after the verdict, but not before the crime. Hence, the law, to be intimidating, should leave the murderer no chance, should be implacable in advance and particularly admit no extenuating circumstance. But who among us would dare ask this? If anyone did, it would still be necessary to take into account another paradox of human nature. If the instinct to live is fundamental, it is no more so than another instinct of which the academic psychologists do not speak, the death instinct, which at certain moments calls for the destruction of oneself and of others. It is probable that the desire to kill often coincides with the desire to die or to annihilate oneself. Thus, the instinct for self-preservation is matched in variable proportions by the instinct for destruction. The latter is the only way of explaining altogether the various perversions which, from alcoholism to drugs, lead an individual to his death while he knows full well what is happening. Man wants to live, but it is useless to hope that this desire will dictate all his actions. He also wants to be nothing. He wants the irreparable and death for its own sake. So it happens that the criminal wants not only the crime, but the suffering that goes with it, even, one might say especially, if that suffering is exceptional. When that odd desire grows and becomes dominant, the prospect of being put to death not only fails to stop the criminal, but probably even adds to the vertigo in which he swoons. Thus, in a way, he kills in order to die. Such peculiarities suffice to explain why a penalty that seems calculated to frighten normal minds is in reality altogether unrelated to ordinary psychology. All statistics without exception, those concerning countries that have abolished execution as well as the others, show that there is no connection between the abolition of the death penalty and criminality. Criminal statistics neither increase nor decrease. The guillotine exists and does crime. Between the two, there is no other apparent connection than that of the law. All we can conclude from the figures, set down at length in statistical tables, is this. For centuries, crimes other than murder were punished with death, and the supreme punishment, repeated over and over again, did not do away with any of those crimes. For centuries now, those crimes have no longer been punished with death. Yet, they have not increased. In fact, some of them have decreased. Similarly, murder has been punished with execution for centuries, and yet the race of Cain has not disappeared. Finally, in the 33 nations that have abolished the death penalty or no longer use it, the number of murders has not increased. Who could deduce from this that capital punishment is really intimidating? Conservatives cannot deny these facts or these figures. Their only and final reply is significant. 
They explain the paradoxical attitude of a society that so carefully hides the execution it claims to be exemplary. Nothing proves indeed, say the conservatives, that the death penalty is exemplary. As a matter of fact, it is certain that thousands of murderers have not been intimidated by it. But there is no way of knowing those it has intimidated. Consequently, nothing proves that it is not exemplary. Thus, the greatest of punishments, the one that involves the last dishonor for the condemned, and grants the supreme privilege to society, rests on nothing but an undefinable possibility. Death, on the other hand, does not involve degrees or probabilities. It solidifies all things, culpability and the body, in a definitive rigidity. Yet it is administered among us in the name of chance and a calculation. Even if that calculation were reasonable, should there not be a certainty to authorize the most certain of deaths? However, the condemned is cut in two, not so much for the crime he committed, but by virtue of all the crimes that might have been and were not committed, that can be and will not be committed. The most sweeping uncertainty in this case authorizes the most implacable certainty. I am not the only one to be amazed by such a dangerous contradiction. Even the state condemns it, and such bad conscience explains in turn the contradiction of its own attitude. The state divests its executions of all publicity because it cannot assert in the face of facts that they ever served to intimidate criminals. The state cannot escape the dilemma Beccaria described when he wrote, If it is important to give the people proofs of power often, then executions must be frequent, but crimes will have to be frequent too, and this will prove that the death penalty does not make the complete impression that it should, whence it results that it is both useless and necessary. What can the state do with a penalty that is useless and necessary, except to hide it without abolishing it? The state will keep it then, a little out of the way, not without embarrassment, in the blind hope that one man at least, one day at least, will be stopped from his murderous gesture by thought of the punishment, and, without anyone's ever knowing it, will justify a law that has neither reason nor experience in its favor. In order to continue claiming that the guillotine is exemplary, the state is consequently led to multiply very real murders in the hope of avoiding a possible murder, which, as far as it knows or ever will know, may never be perpetrated. An odd law, to be sure, which knows the murder it commits, and will never know the one it prevents. What will be left of that power of example if it is proved that capital punishment has another power, and a very real one, which degrades men to the point of shame, madness, and murder. It is already possible to follow the exemplary effects of such ceremonies on public opinion. The manifestations of sadism they arouse, the hideous vainglory they excite in certain criminals. No nobility in the vicinity of the gallows, but disgust, contempt, or the vilest indulgence of the senses. These effects are well known. Decency forced the guillotine to emigrate from Place de la Hôtel de Ville to the city gates, then into the prisons. We are less informed as to the feelings of those whose job it is to attend such spectacles. Just listen, then, to the warden of an English prison who confesses to a keen sense of personal shame, and to the chaplain who speaks of horror, shame, and humiliation. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.